Thanks. Thanks. What's up? What's up, everybody? Good to see you. Thank you for the 12 people that I paid to stand. I appreciate it. Hey, I got a question for you. Why do you do what you do? That, that question is the most important question that you will answer as a leader. I'm not asking you what you do. I'm not asking you how you do it. Those questions are important. I'm asking you why. Like, why do you do what you do? And the answer to that will actually determine not only the durability of your leadership and the length of your leadership, but the effectiveness of your leadership. Um, not long ago, actually, so several years ago, I drove a 1995 um, five-speed Honda Civic with a spoiler on the back, the same ones that Brian, Dom, and Letty drove when they jacked those semis in the very first Fast and the Furious, all right? <laughs> I love that car. I wanted to drive it for a long time, but our family was growing, and so I needed to sell it and uh, put it up for sale. And uh, there was a, an older gentleman that was interested in the car, and so uh, he came to test drive it, and I went with him because I didn't trust him. And uh, I'm in the passenger seat, and he asked me the question that always gets real interesting for me because I'm a pastor. He says, uh, so what do you do for a living? Can I just uh, tell you, if you're ever uh, bored on an airplane, and somebody sitting next to you asks you what you do, just tell them you're a pastor, all right? Just, it's totally fine. Just, just see what it's like. It's a lot of fun. Because what ends up happening is they end up like miraculously cleaning up their language. It's incredible. Like just a second ago, they're dropping F-bombs, and now they're like, you know, using this really lang, you know, slang, you know, good gravy. And it's just like, <laughs> like, really, really? And so I tell him I'm a pastor. He doesn't really respond much. He just kind of, huh. And there's like, like 30 seconds or so of awkward silence that goes by and he's driving down the road without even looking at me. He's looking out the windshield and he, goes, he just asks this question. He goes, you sure you're in the right line of work? <laughs> I was like, I think so. But now that you ask it that way, I don't know. All right. And it's a really good question. I actually have never forgotten it. You sure you're in the right line of work? And could, could I just maybe... Have you considered that question for whatever you do, whatever role you have on the team, whatever your organization is, whatever title is in front of your name, are you sure you're in the right line of work? Now, regardless of your work, your industry, your role, your organization, you're a leader. So the question is, why do you do what you do? And you've got to come up with a good answer to that question. It's got to go beyond income. It's got to go beyond um, title. It's got to go beyond just the, the name recognition. It's got to be something deeper than that, which is why I love the theme of our gathering today is people-centered leadership. And it sounds kind of cliche to say it, but we know it's so true that if you, if you don't put people first, then your leadership is really unstable. And so in order to answer that question of why you do what you do, you've really got to answer the question of what's my passion? And I really think that the, the thing underneath the passion question is what's missing in the world that we need to bring to the table? What need is there? What, what, do, what is burning inside of us that we say, this has got to change? That's your passion. And then you've got to develop this, what I would just call compassion for other people, to rally people to a cause and to recognize that you're not using them. You actually want to go with them. And then you've got to develop a, a courage because at some point it's going to get really difficult and you're going to face a fear and you've got to have the nerve to act and to step into it. See, that what, what makes leadership so critical is the fact that there's so many things that threaten us as people. There's so many fears that we have and that's what leaders do. Leaders step into the fear. Leaders step into oncoming traffic and make the, the tough calls. But then I would say there's like a fourth thing and that's just like this whatever you want to call it, this never give up attitude. It's been called grit before. We like to say around here, just, just a little bit of crazy. I mean, every effective leader is just mildly crazy. And I can tell by looking around the room, there's a fair amount of that here today. <laughs> One of my favorite stories that just sort of illustrates this, and this passage has actually become pretty foundational to who we are as a church, comes out of Mark chapter 2. 
And in Mark chapter 2, Jesus has been teaching and uh, he's gaining more and more popularity because of what he's been doing. Not only what he's been saying, but also the miracles that he's been doing. In fact, if uh, you know Instagram would have been around in the first century, Jesus would have easily had one of those blue check marks because he's, because he's gaining all this popularity and he comes to a really small town called Capernaum that didn't have the capacity to hold an event that was very big. And so Jesus comes to this house and he's teaching and the house immediately fills up. It overflows outside. There's no more seats. And I love how Mark just says, there were four men that came along carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Now, if you know anything at all about the gospels, Mark is the shortest one. He's the most concise. He's like the guys from Dragnet. He's like, just give me the facts, man. Just give me the facts. He's a typical guy. He's just bare minimum, just kind of throws it out there. We don't know anything about these guys. He just says, there were some guys carrying a man on a mat who is paralyzed. You know there's a story behind that. My guess is that these guys have a history. My guess is that they go back a ways. Maybe they were childhood friends. Maybe their families grew up on the same cul-de-sac and they did backyard barbecues and they were high school buddies. And my guess is he wasn't always paralyzed. Maybe they all went to the homecoming game and they had a few too many afterwards and crashed the camel into the palm tree. I, I don't know the story, but there's a story. And this guy's paralyzed and they've got some kind of obligation to him. And they hear that Jesus is in Capernaum in their small town and he's teaching in a house and they develop this passion for their friends. Something needs to change. And they rally some others to a cause. And then they have the courage to actually say, let's take our friend to Jesus. Maybe Jesus can do something about his legs. So they get to the house, but they face a pretty significant problem is that there's no way to get in. The house is completely full. And just think about the options for a second. You're all leaders. This is problem solving. How would you get your friend to Jesus? And maybe you would say, well, maybe we just try to wait around. Maybe somebody will give up their seat. We can go inside. I don't know, maybe we wait till Jesus is finished teaching and the house empties out and we stay around a little bit and then we get our friend to Jesus. That's the most logical solution, I think but not these guys. It's Mark says, so matter-of-factly, he says, they got up on top of the house and tore a hole through the roof and lowered their friend to Jesus. Now, I know some of you are familiar with that story, but think about it for a minute. If you've never heard that before in your life, that's insane. That, that would be like afterwards today, we all decide to go t- to eat, and we go into the restaurant, which you may do, and you put in your name, and they say, well, it's going to be about a two-hour wait, which I hate, by the way. And you say, okay, no sweat. And you huddle up outside in the parking lot. Hey, guys, how about this? How about we go through the roof? <laughs> right? You're going to get sued. You're going to get arrested. Right? I mean, that's just, you're going to get stuff all over you. It's not a very practical solution. Now, I would have loved to have known how the conversation would have gone down between these, these four guys. Because you know it was one person who had the idea. <laughs> they didn't all go, hey, on the count of three, let's just give our best idea. And they all go, one, two, let's go through the roof, right? They, that didn't happen. It was one person who said, let's go through the roof. And you know there was another person, if you know anything about team dynamics, <laughs> that did not think that was a good idea, right? <laughs> Right, these, these are the people that are responsible. These are the people that are like thinking about the lawsuits, thinking about the budget, thinking about the expense. They're like, this is a horrible idea. You can't do this, right? And then there's maybe somebody kind of on the fence who's kind of like, they could go either way. And, I, and maybe there was somebody who else who said, hey man, that wasn't my idea, but I'm gonna empower you to do it. And you see that there was this, what I love about it is there's this passion. Like they could have waited, but they were like, no. Like we want, it wasn't so much about like, if we don't get him to Jesus now, if we wait, like Jesus doesn't have any power to heal him later. It's this is so urgent. We've got to get him to Jesus now. There's something about that that's contagious. We need more of that in the world today. And then we see that there is this, there is this courage that they had. I mean, that takes a lot of nerve to interrupt Jesus' talk and to start tearing a hole through the roof and, and everybody's looking up like, what in the world is going on? It would be somewhat like borderline embarrassing. And yet they said, no, we've got to get our friend to Jesus. And you know, like, I don't know if like, you've ever like torn a hole in a roof, like ever. Something tells me it would take a while. 
Something tells me that after a while, you're starting to second guess yourself. Like, is this the greatest idea? I don't know. And, and we got to have this like determination to follow through with it. And it says they lowered their friend down to Jesus. And I love that story. And I would just say to you today, if there's anything that you walk out of here with, it would be a crystal clear answer to why you do what you do. Because whatever you do, at some particular point, you're going to want to give up. And maybe today there was a few of you that walked in here wrestling with that thought. Because you're like, I don't know if we're being very effective. Seems like I'm getting a lot of criticism here lately. It seems like we keep bumping up against this barrier that we can't get through as a team. This isn't turning out the way that I thought that it would. Our team is dysfunctional right now. On and on and on we can go about all the things that are holding us back and setting us back and all the barriers that are there. Can I just drive you back to passion and drive you back to compassion? Like what is it, what is it that you're doing that actually is for the good of others? And encourage you to, to face your greatest fears because your greatest effectiveness as a leader is straight through external resistance and internal fear. Every single time. And then can I challenge you just to have a little bit of crazy? And some of you just got really nervous right there. You're like, yeah, we know that person on our team. Don't encourage them, all right? <laughs> just a little bit of grit to just do the thing that's unconventional. One of my favorite pastors, Craig Rochelle, says, if we're going to reach people that nobody else is reaching, we've got to do what nobody else is doing. And I would say the same is true in your organization as well. See, see don't give up. Some of you right now are just maybe in the middle of digging a hole through the roof and you're tempted to give up. Maybe some of you have been heading in a certain direction for a certain period of time and you're like, man, I'm starting to flame out. I'm starting to lose my passion. I'm starting to lose that courage that I had. I keep shrinking back. Could I just challenge you to keep going because your greatest setback is a set up for your greatest breakthrough. I don't know how many of you have ever uh, heard of the Chinese bamboo tree, but the seeds of a Chinese bamboo tree, you, you plant it and you water it just like any other seed. But the thing about it is that nothing happens for five years. You plant the seed and nothing sprouts up in year one. There's nothing there in year two, year three, year four. But then in year five, you begin to see something begin to come through the soil. And I was thinking about that this last week. And I was like, what would it have been like for the very first Chinese bamboo tree farmer <laughs> who didn't know that? And he did all the research. He's like, hey, I think this is like an open market. Nobody else has done it. And so he puts together his business plan and he gets a loan from the bank and he, he talks his wife into it. He's like, honey, get ready for Easy Street. There is no competition here. We're going to make a killing. And he goes and he, they invest everything that they have and he plants all these Chinese bamboo tree, tree seeds and one month goes by and nothing's happening. He's starting to get a little nervous and he goes home and his wife says over dinner, she's like, How, how's it going? Fine, it's good, you know, a little slow, but we're all right. Maybe month two, she's like, hey, honey, I actually would love to come down sometime. I'll maybe bring you lunch today, and I'd love to just see how our investment's doing. And he gets real nervous, you know. He's like, well, honey, you know, I mean, it's a little busy. I mean, we've got a lot going on, all right? And, uh, uh, you know, the full, first full year goes by, and she's seen that nothing's come up, and she's starting to question it. She's like, honey, like, did you forget where you planted these seeds, sort of like you forgot our anniversary? I mean, like, you're very forgetful. <laughs> And year two goes by and things start to get really tense. And year three goes by and there's lots of arguments and fights at home. And year four goes by and she's just flat out angry. Year, year five, she's gone into full-blown cynicism. And he comes home at night and she turns around. She says, hey, how was your day being an imaginary Chinese bamboo tree farmer? <laughs> I was just at home all day doing some invisible laundry. <laughs> and making some invisible dinner for you. Maybe tonight we can have some invisible intimacy. All right, I just, <laughs> just the worst. But did you know after five years, the Chinese bamboo tree seed begins to sprout up and within six weeks, they grow 90 feet tall. And I'm just, and he, he's going home going, how you like me now, honey? All right, <laughs> Knew what I was doing all along, sweet baby. 
And I don't know that this is for everyone in the room today, but I do believe this is for someone. Is that there's some of you that are in year five, so to speak, right now, maybe not literally, but figuratively. And you've done everything that you can, and it seems like you've just sort of stalled out as a team. It just kind of seems like things are flat. It seems like things are going in reverse. You've been working and working and working, and it doesn't seem like anything's, you don't have anything to show for it. And I know the feeling of that. That can be so frustrating. Can I just say, would you just keep going? And in those moments, come back to your passion, come back to the people that you do it for, and have the courage, the nerve to act and just get that little bit of crazy, that grit to say, we're gonna keep going until we experience a breakthrough because that's what leaders do. Hey, I'm a pastor. They only gave me 15 minutes to talk, which is, uh, I'm not bitter. All right, just, uh, but I'm out of time. So can I just pray a prayer blessing over you? Father, I come to you right now. I thank you for this room full of leaders. I thank you for who they are and what they do. And I pray today that you would breathe just a fresh wind of passion and courage into them that they would keep going because we need more leaders in the world today that are people-centered. I pray your blessing upon them. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much. Love you guys.